everybody and welcome to Methods of Second Language Instruction for Hebrew. In lecture one here I'm going to uh, give you a little background on the history of language learning and teaching and also set a framework for uh, how we're going to be looking at different language teaching methods over the course of the semester. So we know that in ancient times, groups and individuals would move from one region to another. They would migrate, they would wander, sometimes they were nomadic. And as they moved around from place to place, they would encounter speakers who spoke different languages than their own. Um, and when that happened, they needed a way to communicate with each other. And so that involved usually a lot of gesturing and pointing and holding up objects and pantomiming and so on uh, so that they could make themselves understood. Uh, with the growth of cities in the ancient world, that led to an increase in trade. And it was more than just, I'll trade you five apples for two oranges, uh, that kind of bartering system. This was trade on a larger scale and uh, Businesses had to find a way to keep track of inventories and they needed sales records and they needed especially a way of memorializing agreements in such a way that people couldn't argue about what the terms were. And that led to the invention of writing. That took place approximately 3300 BCE so that's about 5,300 years ago or so. And it happened at the same time in three different places, uh, interestingly enough. It happened in China, it happened in Egypt, and it happened in Mesopotamia. And all three language systems, all three systems, use the same kind of approach to language. Uh, it's called logographic or ideographic. Uh, writing, and that is still the same kind of system that's used today in China. Uh, Chinese is written in characters where the character stands for a word or sometimes an entire concept. That was how all three of those systems worked originally, but both the Sumerian, Babylonian, and the Egyptian systems uh, changed radically over time. That, however, is kind of a story for a different day. So international trade, which also began to grow in the ancient world, that required a way of communicating not in just one language, but in two. And as I said, that process of using gestures didn't work when it came to a written contract. And they needed a way of making it a little bit more systematic. I mean, living in a country long enough to master the vocabulary and grammar of a language, that's a long, long, long process. And human beings are less patient than that. So they wanted a way to make it systematic and faster. Uh, we know how important uh, communication was, international communication in the ancient world. Uh, the Rosetta Stone is a, a fabulous example of a multilingual inscription. Uh, it contains the same passage written in three different languages. Uh, it's written in Egyptian hieroglyphics, in Demotic, which was the day-to-day -day writing system used in, in uh, Egypt, and it's written in ancient Greek. It concerns a decree uh, of the priests of a certain temple regarding Ptolemy V, who reigned from 204 to 181 BCE. Uh, and it's interesting because it was written in both hieroglyphics and ancient Greek, it provided the opportunity uh, for European scholars to actually crack the code of hieroglyphics. And, and it's how we came to understand what the writing in ancient Egypt actually means. So the presence of these kinds of inscriptions tells us how important second language learning was in the ancient world. Uh, but learning a second language, as I said, is a very long and slow process. By the way, when you see the abbreviation L2, that means second language. And when you see L1, it means first language. I should tell you 
uh, we use the idea of L2, a second language, even if we're talking about the fifth or sixth or seventh language that a person has learned. Anything other than one's native language is referred to as L2. So in order to create a more systematic approach to uh, languages, uh, ancient people developed a set of glossaries or bilingual dictionaries. These have uh, lists of words in two columns. <clears throat> one column is in one language. The opposite column is in the other language. This happens to be the world's oldest uh, bilingual dictionary. It's called Ura equals Hubulu. It's a 24 volume dictionary of Akkadian and Sumerian. Akkadian is a language spoken by the people who lived in and around the city of Akkad, which is northern Syria, and Sumerian, which was the oldest language in ancient Mesopotamia. The title of this particular uh, dictionary comes from the very first entry, the first gloss on tablet number one. And Ura is Akkadian and Hubulu is the same thing in Sumerian. They both mean interest bearing debt, which tells you how this thing originated in the business world because so much of it deals with business related items. And it also gives you a little insight into uh, what these two groups thought of as being important. Uh, as I said, there are 24 tablets. Others in the collection contain lists of food and drink words, terms for animals, plants, star names, vehicles, both terrestrial and aquatic, and so on. Um, this particular picture is of tablet 16, which is a list of the various names of stones, including gems which obviously would be things that would be traded. And as I said, having this kind of bilingual dictionary made learning the language much more systematic. You could memorize the list of words, you could know how they're written and how they are pronounced. And uh, you know, we still use bilingual dictionaries to this very day. The second step or a different step in understanding how a language works and being able to master it is understanding its grammar. Now we talk about grammar generally being the rules that govern how a language is put together. How do you string words together to make a sentence? But a grammar is actually a book. It's a description or a study or analysis of those rules that govern any particular language. Uh, the very first one, which is pictured here, is it was written by a, a Sanskrit scholar who lived in India in the fourth century BCE and whose name was Panini. And this particular uh, grammar describes how Sanskrit, how the language works, how you put sentences together. And the name of it is Astayadi, Astayayi, uh, pardon my Sanskrit, I'm not a Sanskrit scholar for sure. Uh, and this particular example is a copy that was done in the 17th century, and it was written on birch bark in the city of Kashmir. Just like the glossaries made learning the vocabulary more systematic, these grammars made learning the grammar more systematic. Like that's helpful and it becomes more helpful as we move along historically. So we know that in ancient times, wealthy families and the nobility hired tutors to teach their children. And the tutor lived in the house, generally speaking, and spent all of their waking time with their charges. Uh, this was one of the ways that languages were taught actually was that the child was raised by someone who spoke that language. Uh, the Romans, for example, would hire Greeks to serve as tutors and the Greeks would speak only Greek to their charges. 
the same situation it continued in the medieval period and the Renaissance, except that in those situations, the tutors spoke Latin. And my mother-in-law, Aleha HaShalom, uh, grew up in a very wealthy family in Germany. And her parents hired French governesses who spoke only French to her from the time she was a very small child. As a result, she spoke French as though she were born and raised in Paris. But that was something that was relegated to the wealthy. Uh, and as the, the society developed in such a way that it became necessary for larger portions of the population to become better educated, again, no one could afford to hire tutors for every child. So schools were developed to again, make things more systematic uh, and to make education more systematic than what happened in the very idiosyncratic life of a child and a tutor. Uh, the Hellenistic model, uh, there were schools in a, all over the ancient world. There were schools for scribes especially. Uh, there were schools for uh, priests and so on. Uh, all, in all different countries. Egypt had its schools, uh, and the model that developed in Greece, the Hellenistic model, really spread across the Mediterranean uh, and took root everywhere, including Judea. Uh, so the teacher would work with a group, which was quite different from working with an individual, and that led to a need for a more systematic approach to teaching language. The traditional approach uh, was invented, the Greeks claimed, by the Greeks. We actually have no idea who invented the system, but the Greeks claimed it, and so they're credited with it. Uh, now, the Greek method consisted of the pupil reading a sentence and translating it word for word. Uh, this same exact method was used in the Jewish schools in the diaspora, and we think even in Judea once Hebrew ceased being the day-to-day -day spoken language. Uh, this method is still practiced today in the Haredi Yeshivot, where the Torah is read in Hebrew one line at a time, and then a child is asked to translate it word for word into Yiddish. There were challenges to this particular system because, frankly, it's a pretty boring way to learn a language and it takes years and years and years. Uh, the big challenge came from a very famous educator by the name of John Amos Comenius also known as Johannes Amos Comenius or Jan Amos Comenius. Uh, he was born in Moravia, which is now Slovakia. Uh, in, he was born in 1592. Uh, he left that region, he left Moravia uh, for religious reasons because he was a Protestant and the official religion of the region became Catholicism and all other uh, religions were banned. Comenius eventually settled in Poland, uh, which was more tolerant toward the Protestants. And while he was in Poland, he was working as a Latin teacher and was, I think, very frustrated by the methodology. He was uh, a rather brilliant educator uh, who made a lot of uh, philosophical changes to the way that we do education. Much of what he uh, insisted on we still do today in terms of multi-sensory education, for example. Uh, anyway, in 1629, he published a textbook for teaching Latin. It was called Janua Linguarum Reserata, The Doors of Languages Unlocked, and it was it contained about 8,000 words that were set into about a thousand sentences within a hundred chapters. And his thesis was that language has to be taught in relation to things. It can't just be out there 
you know, hand somebody an ancient document and make them translate it word for word, he, he felt that was a totally inappropriate way to teach a language. He, in fact, created what is known as direct association, the theory of direct association. And that became really abundantly clear with his next book, which was Orbis Sensualium Pictus, which is the visible world in pictures, which he published in 1658. This was the very first time that illustrations were used in a textbook for pedagogical purposes, not just as decorations. Because each section of the book, each, each lesson, contained pictures that illustrated the concepts that were being taught. So here we have a picture of people on the farm. And you have a picture of a dog, and you see there's a 10 next to the dog. Well, number 10 on the word list is going to be the word for dog. And number one on the word list is going to be the name, the word for trumpeter, because there's a guy playing a trumpet, and so on and so forth. And the entire book was structured this way with tons and tons of copper plate uh, lithographs, illustrations like wood blocks uh, that, that were used to convey the meaning of the words. Um, subsequent innovators along this line included Francois Guillaume, for example. Uh, in 1880, he proposed the notion of using movement to illustrate verbs and to act out um, a language while you were speaking it. So he, he had all kinds of exercises that he developed along those lines. You'll see his work echoed along with uh, that of Comenius. You'll see their work echoed throughout the course. So what this has led to is a pendulum, as it were, a swinging pendulum between cognitive and naturalistic approaches to language learning. So with the cognitive approaches, they treat language learning like other kinds of learning. In other words, there's nothing special about it. You use the same kinds of general learning strategies to learning a language that you would to learning math or to learning geography or to learning uh, psychology or any other specific subject. In the cognitive approach, errors are generally viewed as bad. This is something you want to avoid, and if it's made, it must be corrected. Um, and the first language is often seen as a source of interference to mastering the second language. The naturalistic approaches and we're going to see both kinds of these in the course of, of the class. Naturalistic approaches are really quite different. They treat second language learning as a very unique experience. It's not like learning math or geography or psychology. It attempts to mimic the way that a first language is acquired. In other words, um, to streamline but replicate the process of being dropped into a place where you don't speak the language and having to learn it on your own, kind of a sink or swim method. But it's a sink or swim method that provides a life jacket and a couple of, uh, of inner tubes for you to play with. In naturalistic methods, errors are viewed as a natural part of the process. And for the teacher, they provide insight into where the learner is, what kinds of strategies the learner is using, and at what stage of development they're, they're at. And finally, um, first language interference is not seen as a, as a problem. It's seen as a learning strategy uh, and a positive rather than a negative. So during the rest of our time in the next seven plus weeks, you're going to be uh, exposed to various methods. Some of them are cognitive. Some of them are naturalistic. Some of them are harder to classify. Uh, but I think you will come to see how they can be used and how you can make use of them in your own classroom. 
So with that said, I'm going to turn you loose on the readings for the week. I know there's a lot of them, uh, so uh, get started, and I'll see you later. Take care.